So welcome everyone to the first IICD seminar of the year. We've got a home product giving the first talk. So let me just introduce Sanya Vikovic with a few words. She is Director of Technology Innovation and a core faculty member at the New York Genome Center. She's an assistant professor in biomedical engineering in, at Columbia and a member of this institute as well. Um, her background is in genetics. Um, and then she was a postdoc at the Broad Institute in, of MIT and Harvard. And what she's very well known for is um, technology development, in particular, spatially resolved transcriptomic methods and genomic methods. And she's going to tell us something about her recent adventures in this field as for her talk. So, Sanya, welcome to the seminar series. Thanks for doing the first one. And it's spatial multi-omics technologies at scale. Over to you. Thank you, Simon, for the introduction. Let me just try to share my screen now. <clears throat> um, so hopefully you're seeing my screen and not my notes. <laughs> Um, so thank you again, Simon, for the introduction and for the invitation to be the first, first one this, um, this semester to present. Um, I, in advance, a little bit apologize. I have a pretty bad cold. Um, so, but I'm, I'm going to try to do my best anyways during the next hour. Um, <clears throat> so as Simon mentioned today, I'll be introducing a lot of different spatial technologies and our recent kind of adventure into spatial multiomics. Um, and I'm gonna give you kind of a historic overview how we actually came to the idea of doing spatial and then advancing it in very different areas. Um, so I usually like to start off with this slide. Um, so most of us that have been doing genetics or, or genomics uh, for many years know that a lot of the things our data suffers from is actually confounders. And that could be anywhere, anything and anywhere from, from degradation of tissue to, to the risk factor the patient was exposed to. And what we have, um, uh, my group and many others um, have always struggled is that you know, if, if you collect bulk data, which basically means you're taking a, a piece of tissue, you're mashing it like in a kitchen blender, and then you're extracting DNA or RNA from it um, and sequencing is that uh, most probably what happens with your sample, um, and if, if we're trying to compare the cancer sample to the normal tissue is that um, some few cells that are probably um, either cancer causative or driving um, cancer progression, um, usually get averaged in this big biopsy signal, and you're not actually uh, capturing those changes you were hoping to, to capture. Um, <clears throat> so what I have the best 10 years been doing is technology development. So how can we be smarter, better, uh, more robust, more high throughput, um, you know, with higher resolution um, to be able to actually read out those few cells that are, that are probably um, disease causative. I started off my um, <clears throat> uh, my scientific adventure um, at KTH in Stockholm, which is an engineering school. Um, and there we wanted to ask kind of a question. So, well, we knew pathology was good, but it was pretty old school and we haven't done anything in that field to try to, to you know, uh, make it digital um, and make those, readouts past the, the regular just uh, imaging steps. So uh, let me give you a little bit more background to that problem. So what, what we're looking at here is uh, a tissue microarray, which basically means um, every of these 50 circles uh, describes a patient tissue. And we're looking at corrector cancer patients, so CRC uh, patients. And what happens is that the pathologist, after many years of training, based on the shading of the purple and pink and the sizes and, and the shapes of these cells, um, they, can, they can most probably make a diagnosis or even say um, something about the cancer grading. Uh, and this is usually the metadata you would get uh, when you're trying to analyze um, these images. Um, the problem is it's, it's, it's somewhat subjective. 
Um, the second problem is even if there's a known biomarker for a certain disease, like let's say HER2 in, 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 in breast cancer, is that you could stain the tissue for that particular marker. Um, but usually there's not that many markers that are well known for diseases. Um, also using these a handful, really like three to four known markers won't tell us um, too much or we are not actually able to make de novo discoveries that way. Um, but we like this concept of developing technology which already now has uh, clinical implications. So um, we tried to revise this concept of, of clinical pathology. So we asked the following question. So what if we would take each and single uh, patient issue or, or that circle from, from the previous slide um, and we would split that circle into a grid and let's call each part of this grid a tissue voxel. And what would happen if the, instead of just having the imaging data, we are able to extract um, RNA or DNA sequences, so unbiased information, uh, somewhat unbiased information from each of these voxels. Um, and this is almost the same uh, what we did with spatial transcriptomics, which we published in Science 2016, and I think most people now know it as the, the Vision product from, from 10x Genomics. But instead of actually uh, going through a gruesome task of splitting a tissue section into smaller parts, we, we actually uh, first build a grid. Um, that grid we call a spatially barcoded microarray, which you see on your left-hand side. Um, <clears throat> each and one of these spots that you're seeing that are different shades of green um, actually denote um, through a DNA barcode a Cartesian coordinate on a glass slide, which means that the spot in the upper left corner has a certain ATGC sequence um, that denotes position 1, 1. The, the spot next to it um, has a little bit different sequence that denotes uh, position one, two. And then we go and iterate through 1,000 spots. Um, it's also important to note that uh, it's not like you have one copy of this spatial barcode in one of these spots. You have millions of copies of this barcode. So you can capture a lot of molecules um, on one spot. And if we um, zoom into the design of, of the spots on the right-hand side, what we see is that we have a lumen adapter, a spatial barcode, the UMI and PolyDT, and us that have been in the RNA sequencing space for a very long time, we know this is a typical, um, typical library that will go on an Illumina sequencer. So now we have produced basically a glass slide with a lot of spots on it. Um, and these spots have some type of uh, Illumina adapters. So what are we doing with this glass, glass slide with Illumina adapters? Um, so the second step is actually collecting the tissues, sectioning the tissues, and then uh, placing the tissue on top of your spatial grids. Um, then you can do the hematoxylin and eosine or H and E staining that we saw in that very first uh, image with the tissue microarray from the CRC patients. Um, after staining, we're of course doing the imaging step. So now we're actually collecting the data that, that the clinical pathologist would every day collect. Um, at the point that we're doing the image recording, uh, apart from, again, uh, knowing um, a lot about the cell histology from the morphology um, of the tissue section, we are also recording the coordinates of the tissue relative to our spatial grid, and this is important in the later decoding steps. Um, and now, now the step that's different, that we are not splitting the tissue, we're actually enzymatically treating the tissue to uh, release the mRNA molecules that flow on top of these uh, spatial grade barcodes. And through poly A, poly DT binding, uh, we are capturing them. And after that, we can actually extend from the surface. Uh, this, this happens in the reverse transcription step. And when that step is done, we have covalently bound the gene expression information from tissues directly on top of our spatial grid. Uh, we can release these um, dimers from the surface and do paired end sequencing. So what happens is that before sequencing, we're dealing with the same type of information we, we had uh, previously in histology and still have um, every day in, in the clinics. But after sequencing, we actually um, can map vectors of gene expression to each of the tissue voxels and 
Uh, back then, I think uh, we were collecting on five to 6,000 genes at the time from each of these spots. And to put that also a little bit into perception, how that looks on a mouse brain is that, uh, you know, we could very clearly um, overlay the registered images um, on top of each other. And we are currently looking at the mouse effector, Bob, and we can, um, we could um, fish out genes that were representative of um, certain brain regions. Um, and on the bottom bottom uh, panel, you're seeing uh, those results in some kind of um, architecture labeled by the Allen uh, Brain Institute. So I think when we published uh, our paper in 2016, I mean, we recapitulated not at the same though resolution, but the same number of genes, what the Allen Brain Atlas did in eight to 10 years, we now could do in a RNA sequencing library in a couple of days. Um, I thought this was, you know, uh, pretty exciting. And I wanted to really, you know, we've talked for so many years during the technology development, which took us eight years to apply it to some molecular biology and actually studying some diseases. So I uh, collaborated with um, Hemal Fatnani, who's now also at Genome Center at, and um, Columbia University Medical School, is that we wanted to ask the question whether spatial transcriptomics and, and their data resolution it has can help us distinguish and clarify what's going on with the molecular pathology during ALS disease progression. So just a couple of you know, very brief slides into ALS so that you can put some of the results in context. So ALS is motor neuron disease. The name says uh, basically um, some motor neurons in a very specific part of your spinal cord die. Uh, the more the motor neurons die, the more severe the symptoms, and unfortunately, always lethal within three to five years after diagnosis. Uh, ALS has been studied for a very long time. Uh, there, we know now some of the genes responsible for, for that are ALS causative, but only um, approximately 10% of patients um, have mutations in these genes, where uh, still 90% is completely sporadic. Uh, we don't have a defined mechanism of progression, uh, but we have decided to um, basically focus our study on the SOD1 mutation, which was the first mutation described that has lumbar onset um, in human and mice. And why we chose that is that uh, we know that with the SOD1 mutation, there is motor neuron loss, it's visible on the histology, and we know already that um, it involves both cell autonomous and non-autonomous processes. Uh, but we don't know that much what those processes are. Um, so we reason that by applying spatial transcriptomics and applying it in mice and then mapping it to human samples, uh, we had a chance to deconvolve what's going on with the disease um, over time. Um, <clears throat> So what we did actually is then in the course of a year, we collected over 1,900 tissue sections, which I think is still, still today the, the largest spatial transcriptomics data set we ever, ever produced. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you're seeing just an overlay of the histology and the spatial spots uh, that are giving you the, the vectors of, of gene expression. On the right-hand side, uh, you're basically seeing uh, <clears throat> all those tissue sections registered in a common coordinate system and color coded and by certain morphological areas of interest. And the ones that the, the area that we were initially very interested in is colored in orange and it's called the ventral horn. And it's, it's this part of the tissue where the motor neurons reside before death. <clears throat> um, and this is a very uh, you know, typical example from this study. Uh, we're looking at expression of a gene called GFAP. Um, it's, it's a very known my, my marker of ALS. It's a marker of gliosis, basically um, <clears throat> um, the expression in astrocytes goes up as the disease progresses. So what we're seeing is um, two panels, the top and the bottom. The top panel is your wild type mouse condition and the bottom panel is your um, SOD1 or the ALS mice. 
And each column depicts um, different time point. So we're going from P30 to P120. So P30 is, is you know, mice have just become adult. Um, there is no um, kind of disease symptoms. Uh, P120 is end stage disease and we have to sack the mice because the symptoms are extremely severe. So something happens in these time points between P70 and P100, okay? At P100, we can definitely in the histology see that the motor neurons have died. Um, if we focus just a, a tad bit on the lower panel, we see that you know, at P100, P120, we have a huge, huge gliosis going on. Um, and this is something that we were expecting. But we didn't really, uh, you know, go through go through the task of of sacking this many mice and creating a data set of 1,900 uh, tissue sections to look at one gene. Uh, we could have done that by immunofluorescence. Um, okay, so now let's let's look at three genes at a time um, that are uh, kind of specific for to three different parts of of the spinal cord. Um, and again, every, every kind of, um, again, these are very marker genes, um, the white matter, the ventral horde, the dorsal horde. Um, they're depicted in blue, green, and purple. And we could also confirm these traditional markers we're supposed to see in ALS, uh, in immunofluorescence. So we're very, very confident in the results we're seeing. Uh, but what we actually wanted to do is very different. We wanted to see what are the spatial temporal gene expression programs, not individual genes, but gene programs, um, and how they vary from left to right as the disease progresses, and whether actually they're connected not only uh, that a certain gene in a certain cell type in a certain area goes up or down, but whether the cell types potentially um, even migrate uh, through the spinal cord. And this is kind of a hard, hard task to do. And we, we did our best by defining the gene programs and then mapping the gene programs on publicly available single cell data sets. So when, what we can see, for example, some programs on the left-hand side uh, belong to neurons. And you can see that these programs uh, map spatially all over the place, right? Uh, both in the dorsal horn, the ventral horn, uh, and, and so on. While, for example, some oligos, they, they map on the white matter as, as they should. Um, but then the interesting results, um, we can, we found the best way to depict them is this, is that um, if we're focusing on the ventral horn, this is where, as I said, motor neurons die. And we're going from left to right from P30 to P120. And we're looking just at, at full changes of genes, um, you know, um, that are upregulated in the SOD versus the wild type. Um, so what we see is, is that at P70 and P100, um, there's, there's a lot of programs that start going up. And we can map these uh, particular programs, again, over time and over space. And we can actually pinpoint certain targets that might be interesting to study. And uh, again, every single time we thought something is interesting, we had to go and confirm it and validate it by IFs because... There's so much in literature that we found. We just, you know, we didn't know if, if these genes are actually, you know, there and, and causative. So we started with the with time point P100. If we found actually a gene peroxyredoxin 6 that's co-localized with uh, a GFAP that was in the previous slides that said, oh, it's, it's GFAP goes up, right, when disease goes up. Um, so does peroxyredoxin 6. But I think the next slide is the, the one that was most interesting in the whole study, which is, you know, we wanted to, we, we weren't that interested in the programs when the disease already started. We were interested in the programs that, that you know, are up or down regulated uh, pre-motor neuron loss, which is at the P70 time point. So at P70 on the, on the left-hand side, you're looking again at spatial transcriptomics data. We just hex binned it this time. Um, top panel is the wild type condition. Bottom panel is the SOD1 ALS condition. And we see up regulation on the BP TREM2 program. So TREM2 is actually in stage two clinical trials for AD. And this is something that we also see in our data that, you know, 
a lot of, of TREM2 is actually expressed just next to the motor neurons and just in this condition before they die. Um, I would say that it probably took us a year to collect the data, a year to figure out what to do with the data, probably a year in validations of, of IFs to get this data set done. Uh, but I think we really needed the, to create that to, to know what, what are the next steps for the technology. So what's my next job? Um, because you know I, I'm an engineer by training and use, making technologies is what I do. So we identified the kind of three points we needed to work on. Um, one is that we really needed to work on making multimodal measurements. And that's because the spatial transcriptomics data is intrinsically super noisy. Um, we also needed to potentially connect it with protein data to skip this one year of validations, to be honest. Um, second, if we wanted to know more about the system and the biology, we had to find a way to perturb it. Um, when we started with the spatial host microbiome sequencing project, um, this was like five, six years ago, and no one was, was talking about perturbing a whole mouse, right? Um, but now, like, as, as of a month, month ago with IMAP, we can probably do that. And then three, we really needed to work on the resolution. Um, and we thought we were going to go in that direction, what, what the technologies developed, one, two, and three, but ended up, uh, you know, all three were being done at the same time. So what do we mean by spatial multiomics? Um, so we asked the question, can we sequence proteins? And let me kind of, you know, a little bit digest that for you. So when we're doing normal in immunofluorescence staining, um, you know, your primary antibodies are labeled with some type of fluorophore. And you're using probably a cocktail of one to two antibodies, maximum three. And this is because the fluorophores that uniquely map these antibodies most probably overlap in the spectra that your normal microscope can read out. Um, so we asked the question, what would happen if we, in combination with, or instead of using immunofluorescent antibodies, we would actually use side sick type of antibodies, which means that those antibodies, instead of having a unique fluorophore, are uniquely, uh, coded with a DNA barcode. Um, so each of different antibody has a different barcode sequence followed by a polyadenylated tail. Um, so now imagine a reaction where you put, let's say, uh, two IF labeled antibodies and the same two antibodies labeled with DNA tags. What would happen is that your immunofluorescence signal you will read out with the microscope. Um, but your um, barcoded antibodies will actually bind to the antigens in the tissue, hopefully the specific and correct ones. And then the, the barcodes from the antibodies will actually bind to the spatial barcodes on the surface through an extension reaction very similar to the spatial transcriptomics um, protocol. We can now copy that information on the spatial grid and sequence. Um, and actually you need very little sequencing to, to decode that. Um, the typical result, as I just explained, that, that reaction is your, on your left-hand side, and we're looking at the canonical architecture in the mouse spleen, where you have the red and white pulp um, that are basically um, tagged with two different antibodies, F480 and IgD on your left. Um, and on your far left, we're seeing the immunofluorescence reaction happening. And then we see actually the decoded uh, antibody barcodes again for F48 and IgD that we got through sequencing. Um, the point, of course, wasn't to just use two antibodies. Two antibodies or three we could use with immunofluorescence. Now we can use a panel of over 50 antibodies at a time. And on the right hand side, you're just looking at a proof of concept with using six antibodies um, in this in this system. Um, again, this doesn't make this multimodal, it just makes it very cool to be able to uh, move away from immunofluorescence. Uh, but this is maybe the step that makes it multimodal. Um, so on your top, you're seeing um, the proteins, um, <clears throat> some of the proteins from the previous slide. But on the bottom, you're seeing actually the mRNA signals picked up on the same spatial array. And then you can do, you know, very basic things uh, because, you know, we are engineers and we, we should spend more time on data analysis, but some things we just don't have time. 
And then we can do these type of predictions, what happens with the proteins versus the mRNA and what controls it and can we understand it better. And I guess there's a lot more that can be done on this, this type of technologies. And I'm actually super happy if someone wants to talk later uh, about projects that they think would be interesting on this. So the second thing we also knew with after the ALS study is that we really need to automate all the workflows, which we have done now. So now the throughput is around 96 reactions in a couple of days. And before it was probably 16 per week. Um, and this is again, um, all in spatial multi-omics as well. Um, <clears throat> Um, so now to go uh, super briefly into spatial uh, host microbiome sequencing, we just posted on Bio Archive last month. So, uh, you know, I'm, I've been for a very long time kind of intrigued by, by the microbiome and wanted to see, first I, I thought, okay, let's do imaging. Um, and I, I read the, quite a few imaging papers and you know, some beautiful papers came out 2016, 17, but all were focused on decoding maybe spatially one to two genera uh, at maximum at a time. And no one was really focusing on trying to, you know, dissect uh, which microbes actually have an influence on which of the cells, uh, which is something that I was super interested in. Um, so we tried to design a project we called Spatial Host Microbiome Sequencing and still keep calling that uh, even after five years. Um, so what we thought was super neat and simple, took us a long time still to develop as these things usually go. Um, so instead of um, having a spatial array just with a PolyDT capture sequence, we actually now know how to you know, buy a Visium array um, and modify that Visium array for any type of capture sequence that you want. And this capture sequence here is that now our capture sequence will be a combination of uh, PolyDT capture still for RNA for the host, um, but we also copy pasted basically a 16S reverse primer in there um, that's V4 specific. Um, after that step, you're doing all the other things the same, right? You're placing a tissue section, you're staining it, you're imaging it. Um, you have a very specific uh, permeabilization cocktail that works good for the host and for bacteria. And now you're capturing the 16S and um, RNA sequences on your array. Um, what we struggled for a long time with is actually the databases. Uh, and I know this, this you know, has been reiterated many times in the, in the metagenomics field, but um, in the end, uh, what we did is that, uh, you know, we assembled our own databases for met metagenomes uh, based on those identities. We, we downloaded the full genomes from, from NCBI. And then we figured out we actually cannot use Kraken too efficiently to uh, identify genera in our data because the data is actually not typical 16S uh, sequencing. It's much shorter and it only has one, one reverse 16S primer and not a primer pair. So we actually had to build a DL model on top of Kraken to, to be able to very efficiently classify um, the spatial host microbiome data. Um, after that step is done, then we kind of went through this task of thinking, well, you know, okay, so now we have some gene programs we can identify in specific regions of interest in a SPF mouse, which is a normal laboratory mouse, right, uh, which should have all the um, microbiome intact. Um, but then we realized, of course, right, we need a uh, control, and that control is a germ free we also probably needed positive control, which is an ASF mouse. Uh, so it's a mouse with very specific flora that you inject in a germ-free mouse, and then uh, it's supposed to recapitulate the, the full flora um, in, in a normal laboratory mouse. Uh, but to cut the story short, after you know five years of optimizations and, and figuring out what to do with the data, uh, today I can say, well, uh, you know, the protocol is good enough. Uh, uh, you can get host expression of probably 13, 14,000 genes in a spot. 
And if we look at the germ-free mouse on the left and the SPF mouse on the right, and an ex expression of a typical gene called APCAM, which is supposed to line this inner part of your gut, uh, we see it's, it's expressed where it should be. Great. Uh, then when we look at bacterial expression, well, we look on the left-hand side, wow, there's no bacteria in GF mouse. Well, good. Uh, it means that the, the mouse was kept in sterile conditions and we see a lot of bacteria on the right in the SPF mouse. Um, but what we were actually interested in is, you know, um, bacteria line the gut in different ways. Um, you have the pellet in the middle, you have the mucus um, that's connected to the tissue. And then you have, because it's a 3D architecture in the colon, right? The bacteria actually flow down even to, from the apex to the upper mid, mid and base of the crypt. Um, so we wanted to figure out um, whether there's any programs or genes that, that get upregulated in SPF mouse in the presence or because of presence of bacteria. And if those gene programs can then again be connected to some type of um, cell type signatures. Um, which is, I think we see in this slide, but it's a little bit hard to digest it. So uh, let me, you know, try, try to do that for you. Um, so we are basically seeing um, log FDR heat map um, of uh, gene ontology terms. The upper half of the heat map is your SPF mouse, the lower is the GF mouse. On the right hand side, you have color coded tags of different cell types in different regions. And then what we see in the SPF mouse, of course, that um, for certain regions, we also have presence of certain bacteria. Where in the GF, GF mouse, we don't have bacteria, They're, they didn't get mapped, right? It's just um, 50 out of half a million reads get mapped to bacteria. It's just like nothing, it's noise. Um, what we see is that if we, for example, zoom in um, to tough cells, um, tough cells in the presence of fauna fracture um, have these gene programs, right? Tough cells, here in the presence of coprococcus have a different gene expression program. And then finally, tough cells in presence of these three bacteria and bacterial genera, they exhibit this type of metabolism. Whereas if we look down on the GF mouse, we don't see any of these programs uh, because there's no presence of bacteria, most probably. And then I, I would say that it's very nice to see results that look like this um, at the end of the study, which means that um, in SPF mouse, for example, in the presence of pseudobacterial vibrio, we see expression of CCAM genes, CCAM2, uh, 1, 20, and so on. And these are actually the genes that lie the mucus um, of the bacteria. Uh, so it's just on the border of the apex and the pellet um, in the colon cross section. And then finally to switch to the third project, which was, again, the result of the AOS study is that we knew we needed to increase the spatial resolution. So we kept on reading voxels. We didn't want to read huge voxels anymore. We wanted to figure out if we can bring this down to single cell resolution or even, even lower if possible. So in order to do that, we had to switch out how we're producing our grids. So on the left-hand side, you see your our traditional um, 2016 um, grids. So those were 100 micron in resolution, but they were very simple to produce. So you would buy a thousand oligos from IDT and you would spawn them with an inkjet printer in a grid. You didn't have to perform any decoding because you know exactly which oligos you bought, exactly which oligo was in each IDT plate when you bought them, and where the capillary spotted it on the glass line. But if we wanted to increase resolution, uh, we needed to increase the number of spots we have. Well, you know, if we wanted to produce an array on the right that's approximately, let's say, 2,000 times 800 little spots, um, I guess we would probably had to you know, waste 20 to $30 million at IDT. So no one's gonna do that, right? So we had to, had to come up with a smarter way of doing this. So we went back to literature and of course, you know, because we're tech nerds, uh, we thought that we can uh, 
repurpose all the Illumina beta rays. Um, so the, the barcoded beta ray technology is based that each, each one of these beads has a separate uh, sequence. The beads are approximately two micron size and three micron um, center to center. But the problem is they're random. So when we produce bead pools, we have no clue where each bead ends up. We just know that they're unique. Um, the first part of the process is we had to re-engineer how, how we're making the bead pools. So bead pools, basically the collection of beads you would put on the array. And the more unique beads you have in your bead pool, the higher the chance is that they're going to be unique as well on your spatial glass slide. Uh, in order to do this relatively cheaply, um, we went to the, back to the classical split and pull concept. Uh, this means that first we bought three different plates of oligos from IDT. In the first plate, we had 65 different oligos. So in 65 uh, different reactions, we put beads. Uh, so 65 different oligos, they, they coupled to 65 um, wells with beads. Um, after that, we pull all the beads from, from all the 65 wells into one tube. And we distribute that, all those beads into the second plate of oligos that has 211 oligos. Um, what happens now is that uh, after this, again, the coupling reaction is happening to the first oligo that's coupled to the beads, is that after the first split and pull, you have 65 <laughs> times 211 um, different beads in your bead pool. Uh, again, we're collecting all the beads after these 211 reactions have been performed and we put it in a third plate of oligos. This is again repeated and we're adding now in total 65 times 211 times 211 different uh, beads. And then in the end, the final product, the bead pool has uh, three different parts. It has the A, the B and the C, basically from IDT plate A, IDT plate B or IDT plate C. So it has one of, the, one of each of those. Um, when you're making this pool of, let's say, I think this was 2.4 different million, um, 2.4 million different beads, um, you're depositing in the, that in approximately 1 million wells. You're expecting some redundancy uh, based on the Poisson distribution. Uh, but you end up with something that looks very similar to this. You have wells, um, each bead goes to one well because wells are etched, etched at 2.05 microns and you have a two micron bead so you can maximum have one bead in one well. Um, and after that step is done, you have to go through a decoding step. So I won't spend too much time on the decoding step because I, again, it, this has been done for years, is, but I'll, I'll put the simple example how to decode um, <clears throat> one of the oligos. Uh, for example, um, from the red part of the spatial barcode, so can, can have uh, one of the 65 combinations of oligos. And we can do that if we're using, for example, decoders, and decoders are complementary oligos um, to the spatial barcode. Um, we can order decoders from IDT, one is in green, one is in black, one is in red. So if we want to decode 65 uh, oligos, uh, basically we need to have approximately four decoding cycles. So in the bottom part, what happens is that if we're just focusing on these uh, three bead positions that are in the little rectangular, rectangular is that um, we're adding first um, a dictionary. We have a dictionary of colors and oligos. So we're first psycho adding um, <clears throat> oligo one, two, and three. And in our dictionary, um, we said that oligo one, two, and three in psycho one are all going to be green. Because they're on green, all three beads pop up as green. So we don't know which actually uh, bead has the oligo one, oligo two, and oligo three. So we, the, the, we repeat that in cycle two. Okay. We again, based on our dictionary of colors and combinations, we put in uh, oligo one in green, oligo two in green, and oligo three in green. Okay, again, we can't decode which one is which. And then we come to finally cycle four for this specific oligos. And then we know that we have added um, oligo one decoder in green, oligo two decoder in uh, red, and, and oligo three decoder dark, basically without any color. Um, 
And again, through this redundancy of colors, we can decode in a total of 14 decoding cycles. We can decode the full 1 million uh, beads on, on top of an array. Um, and fortunately, this is so standardized in an Illumina production facility, they can do it for you in about three hours and then 15 minutes of processing time on a server. Um, after you've produced your now very densely packed spatial grid, you can again repeat the process. You can section, you can stain, you can extract the RNA on top of the barcodes, and you can sequence. Uh, but this is your, your um, difference in resolution. So, you know, top, top view is, is traditional ST and bottom view is, is HDST or high definition spatial transcriptomics, as we call this technology. Um, and then if we place that again back into the Alan Bernatos data, top, top panel is your ST, middle panel is Alan Bernatos, and then bottom panel is your HDSD data. So now we could actually really say that we are matching the resolution of the images in Alan Bernatos, and we can recapitulate the atlas in about two days. Um, and then I think we, you know, we didn't spend that much time again on the on the data analysis, but we could very clearly, you know, identify in cell types in certain layers. We can identify the genes in certain layers, and we also made sure that we could apply it somewhere something from us, not the mouse brain. So we actually took to occur to positive uh, breast cancer samples, fresh frozen, and we repeated this task. So. I think what we actually want to spend, you know, time in my lab doing now is that asking questions that that can maybe be summarized like this. There are probably better questions as well. So we want to know which cells are disrupted, um, how communications be cell, between cells are disrupting. Can we identify those disrupted communications? So what are the extrinsic ones versus the intrinsic ones? Can we potentially say something about the effect of the drug if we have a perturbed system? So I think I can summarize, you know, the three main points I want to work on in the next year. Uh, one is that we need to be better at designing our spatial studies. Uh, so we need to have statistical workflows for the spatial study design. Um, we have to really think of, of then applying it um, where we have some kind of a perturbed, genetically perturbed system like in, this, in CRC. Um, and then I think we have um, spent extremes amount of money on, on computation. And we have to work on not just writing code, but writing good code um, and scalable code. And that's actually a big bottleneck for us right now. Um, I will just end by, with this slide and thanking my many founders and mentors over the years. And I'm extremely happy to be now at Columbia, both at BME and ICD. And I know we might not have too much time for questions, um, but that's why I put my email there. So please do reach out. Um, thanks. And I guess I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can um, maybe um, do a Q&A. Right. Thanks very much, Sanya. I think there are three questions in your chat. If you want, yeah, I'm opening them now. Maybe others will pop up in a second. Um, yes. Yeah, so, first question is: Can you do spatial proteomics and transcriptomics? Yes. Um, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, I think. Uh, we don't have a limitation of the number of proteins we can detect. We have a limitation of what antibody cocktails exist and work well. And I think currently we're the highest one we're testing is 122 panel uh, from um, BioAgent uh, because we don't have don't want to spend too much time validating these huge huge antibody panels. So we are relying on the commercially available ones. Uh, but you just need you know. Uh, two times 25 basis sequence um, on the MySeq to kind of decode those 122 proteins. So it's kind of smooth. Uh, are there any risks of oversampling? Uh, currently, no, I think we're still undersampling. <laughs> um, and that's, that's because the data is still too noisy. Uh, so we need to put in effort into 
making it even more robust and even more um, better efficiency of capture on, on the slides. And I think that's what HDST also taught us is that the quality of the sequences of, on the surface is actually the, the main step to, to make that happen. Uh, does it work on any type of section, frozen versus non-frozen? Uh, yes, so uh, it, it's frozen, it, you can grow cells on it. So if you want to perturb directly on the array, you can do that. If you want to use FFB, you can do that as well. Um, any more questions? So I, th I think you, if you're online, you can ask the questions rather than type them. Thanks. Hi, Tanya. Thanks for the uh, for the talk. Uh, so, uh, related to the noise question, uh, can computation or sort of imputation noise cancellation uh, alleviate that concern? Yes. yes. So that's exact. I I didn't you know for the purpose of time. I I didn't spend. Uh, I didn't do it justice, honestly, on the computational side. We did do a lot of development on that. And yes, part of it is imputation. Um, and it, basically what, you know, a data set of 1,900 section enables you is to share information between regions, right? Once you register the sections, um, um, you know, you combat basically noise by saying, let's share information between morphological regions that, you know, in the metadata are the same. Um, but also we have to be careful that this is spatial data so that we actually have a car model in there that says, well, you know, well, it's not smooth too much, uh, but there is some smoothing of the data uh, going on. Yeah. Thanks. And a, a, a separate question, unless anybody else has others, it has to do with the uh, microbiome, gut microbiome yeah. <laughs> work, obviously. So the there is some population genetics theory that suggests that the, the different uh, different uh, cavities allowed for different uh, different populations, different beams, uh, sort of, and, and, and all the, in, in a tall story fashion, all the uh, populations that are deep in the, uh, in the cavity are each different from one another, but the, the ones that are closer to the to the middle axis, uh, axis of the gut are, are more similar. Uh, yes. Are you seeing something like that? <laughs> yes, uh, very much so. I think there's very few populations that are actually uh, exclusively in the mucus or you know deep in the tissue. Uh, a ton of populations are in the middle of, of the gut, right? Uh, but what they're doing there, how they're communicating, who knows, right? Um, I think there's probably, you know, less than 10 genera that are exclusively lining the tissue. Um, and yes, there is, um, and literature also confirms that, right, that there, this is connected to the availability of oxygen um, through, as, as from the middle of the gut lower and how, how much phosphates there are there. Um, and that's why, you know, the whole uh, field of biofilm is kind of built on today. Um, what I, you know, this is the first time I ever present this project, so it's kind of exciting. I, I don't, I don't know. I, what I would like, you know, to discuss with someone is what's, how, how should I actually interpret this data? Is it just because the microbes are there? This is the gene program that's upregulated. Probably not, right? I mean, there's something is in, intrinsic to mouse genetics as well. It can't be just the microbiome, but this is something that I think would be cool to really sketch out mathematically on a, on a whiteboard and think through a little bit more. Sure, we would definitely want to continue this offline. Sure, awesome. You. Any more questions? Thank you. You have to. We're not quite very. We're not very efficient with this system. But. Uh, I just wanted to ask: How do you uh, discriminate between a new signal versus a cellular rearrangement in your 
uh, temporal data, like if you have spatial transcriptomic temporal, and if you see a signal, how do you know that it's a new signal versus just cells moving around? Okay, so if I'm interpreting this correctly, uh, so how do I know, you know, it's not, let's say if we have four time points, that it's not just something that's, oh, goes up in two and goes up in four and it's down in one and three uh, versus it's uh, just goes up in four. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, yeah, if you have like two time points. Yeah, I know, like I know. Yeah. yeah. And then what, what do you see in T1? Is it just like whatever already present in T naught and just move to someplace else? Or is it like actually new gene expression that has popped okay, up? So, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so what we used, so the model we, we used uh, treats genes independently. So that's one caveat to that. The second is um, there's, we didn't put any weights on the distances between certain regions in the model. So we are treating all the regions in the tissue the same, wherever, if they're neighbors or they're not neighbors. So there's a lot of things to do there. Um, that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing, we're also treating time the same. So whether we're calling it T1, 2, 3, or 4, or T1, T100, T400, uh, for the model, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, but what we based it on is that, oh, if it's upregulated in, in T2 versus T1, and then keeps on being upregulated, um, you know, by saying the base factor is always up, that's, that's what we did in that study. Um, we're trying to think of ways how to do this better, uh, because I have a, another data set that is actually dealing with aging of the gut. So from when the mice are born to when the mice die. So it's like a two year worth of data collection. Uh, and there, I think we have to be better and smarter because in the gut, everything moves around all the time as compared to the spinal cords. Uh, a couple, a couple more have popped up on the. Yeah. So I'll read it out loud uh, for everyone. I don't know if they see it in the room. So, uh, with the understanding, we all of us want to do spatial temporal genomics. Um, how can we perturb a system and control that? So, um, I think. I, I'm not sure how to do that in human data, but let's just spend a little bit of time on mouse data. So, you know, I think, when was it, a month or two ago, there was a beautiful paper in Cell or set of papers in Cell that said, well, instead of locally perturbing mice now, which we have known how to do either with the Cree locks or, or, or CRISPR-Cas for years. So now we can actually make a mouse and perturb all the tissues at the same time. Um, I think probably using that type of system and then maybe, um, you know, thinking of, of um, sampling mice at different stages. So for example, we perturb the mice, right? We take the evolutionary part or sorry, the um, developmental part um, we set different time points, and, but then we also let the mice grow and see, see what happens. Uh, but that depends on the genes, of course, we're perturbing. So I think that's one of the, the neat ways we could do to actually uh, try to map spatial temporal genomics. Because without the perturbation, I think that's extremely hard because, again, we don't know what's intrinsic or what's extrinsic signal in a microenvironment. Um, uh -huh. So what, what do I want to apply my technologies to? Um, so these were kind of specifically, you know, especially the host microbiome was designed for the thought of um, trying to uh, map whether the microbiome has influence or CS shape progression. Um, that's one thing. Um, and I think hopefully, you know, with some collaborations at Columbia that that's going to come true and we'll actually be able to see if that's 
uh, th that's a confounder. Um, the second one is uh, aging. Um, and again, I like to focus on CNS and ENS. So that's going to be definitely a big theme. Um, and then, I don't know, it's, I guess, you know, it's naturally to, to develop, to kind of proceed in this neurodegeneration field. Um, worked in it for a while. I finally think I understand some of the biology. <laughs> um, so that's, that's going to be the third theme of, of the lab. Right. So I think we should let you off the hook, Sanya. We've got a couple of minutes before potentially the next class moves in here. So okay. Thanks very much indeed for a very nice talk. And it's nice to start with a, a home person. Uh, thanks again. And I'm sure you'll get lots of people interested in collaborating. So they'll be pinging you, I'm sure. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm happy for that. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>